Hello, welcome back. In this video, I would like us to consider the relationship between feminism and the science of biology. In particular, we shall be looking at the relationship between feminists and evolutionary theory and sexual selection. This will be the third video in the series titled Feminist Science. So without further ado, let's begin. I think it's fair to say that in feminist study courses, more typically known as either women's studies or gender studies, the attitude towards biology, and evolutionary theory in particular, can best be described as antagonistic, if not openly hostile. The problem feminism has with biology is easy to determine. For feminists and religious fundamentalists alike, biology, particularly evolutionary theory, presents an intractable problem. The consequence is that when we view the content of many gender studies courses, we find an ill-disguised belligerence towards science. Feminism has opened two fronts in its assault on biology. The first is a general denial that gender differences are biological. Instead, the argument repeatedly made is that gender is a social construction. The other preferred means of attack is to claim that the science of biology, in particular evolutionary biology, is simply sexist, and we find this position repeated often in the relevant course materials. The objective one supposes is that if biology is a product of male chauvinism, it can be dismissed and replaced with ideas more compatible with feminist ideology. In their book, Professing Feminism, Daphne Patti and Loretta Kirchi, both traditional feminists, criticise this open hostility to science, which they describe in the book as biophobia. Patti is a professor of literature, and Kirchi is a philosopher of science both well-respected within their own fields. According to Patti and Kirchi, academic feminism has become derailed. It has become an exercise in indoctrination. It has become an aberration. Both authors have become so convinced that this is the case that the term indoctrination is the subtitle of their book. This anti-science stance is in line with the standard social science model, often referred to by its acronym SSSM. This model pervades the social sciences, and feminists subscribe to a particularly strong version in support of their worldview. Not only is science viewed as a social construction, but biological sex itself is considered a construction. It is extremely concerning what is taught and driven home in feminist studies courses. For example, it is taught that men, in general, are not inherently physically stronger than women. The idea that they are inherently stronger is simply a social construction. Male upper body strength is simply a product of a male-dominated society. An example of this line of reasoning within academia can be found in the work of such academics as Dr. Anne Fausto Sterling, a feminist biologist who is often cited in feminist literature. When we read the introductory text on her website, we find the following. Using a groundbreaking new approach to understanding gender differences, Dr. Fausto Sterling is shifting old assumptions about how humans develop particular traits. Dynamic systems theory permits one to understand how cultural differences become bodily differences. When we look at the introductory text explaining dynamic systems theory, we find the following, and I quote, A divide exists between people who accept biological explanations of human difference and those who reject biology in favour of social explanations. But the very premise of nature versus nurture is misguided. Dynamic systems theory permits us to understand how cultural differences become bodily differences. It seems the good doctor has become convinced that societal influences can determine phenotype. Extraordinary. Lamarckism triumphs over Darwinism in the world of feminist biology. Feminism, it seems, needs to regress the 17th century biology in support of its 21st century ideology. We are not considering here the concept of environmental influence on trait expression, but societal determination of phenotype. At the risk of annoying some of my viewers, perhaps an explanation might be worthwhile for those not familiar with some of the terms used. If we consider a trait such as aggressive behaviour, for instance, most males have this trait, but its expression 
is dependent on environment. In volatile environments, we would expect to see this trait expressed more often than not. But in peaceful or secure environments, we would expect to see the expression of this trait less frequently. The trait itself is a product of Darwinian evolution, but the expression of this trait is dependent on the environment. What Dr. Faustio Sterling is suggesting is that societal pressures can influence the phenotype itself. So it is not Darwinian selection that determines dimorphism, but society. It's a very convenient theory, if one's purpose is to dispose of gender as a biologically determined trait. As a theory, one cannot help but be reminded of the work of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who prior to Darwin suggested that acquired characteristics could be inherited. It is no coincidence that this mode of thinking became fashionable in the old Soviet Union, where a form of Lamarckism was revived in the 1930s, when the Soviet state promoted Lysenkoism for ideological reasons. So in the Soviet, we had a form of neo-Lamarckism used to support Lysenkoism. And now in Western universities, we see the emergence of a new form of Lysenkoism embedded in feminist theory that necessarily rests on theories suspiciously similar in nature to Lamarckism, all of which seem to go unchallenged within the academy. Anyone who would like to learn more about Lysenko and his impact on Soviet science should watch King Crocoduck's video, The New Lysenkoists, which covers the topic in detail. King Crocoduck also has many great videos on physics as well. A link to his video will be posted in the description box below. This new strain of feminism has embraced an ideology that no matter how good its intentions is doomed to failure, for the same reason that the communist experiment failed in the Soviet Union. Any theory based on a misapprehension of the nature of human biology will go the same way. Feminists experiment with theories that rest on the concept that genders are simply a social construction. In so doing, they fight a biology that has developed over millions of years of evolution, and nature, they will discover, is completely disinterested in the fancies and pet theories of feminist scholars. Now, this video would not be complete unless we considered the topic of sexual selection, the very mention of which is guaranteed to incite a rabid Pavlovian response from feminist theorists. To gain an insight into the feminist view of sexual selection, we can turn to our sample feminist scholar, Dr. Fausto Sterling, who in her book Myths of Gender, while not rejecting sexual selection, sniped at the theory from a safe distance. She is, after all, a biologist as well as a gender studies professor, so she could not bring herself to the point where she felt able to challenge such a well-established theory. But she does attempt to undermine the theory by using an argument for which, by all accounts, she's become famous for. Her argument is that the male-female dichotomy is a false one. If that dichotomy is false, then so is the dye in sexual dimorphism. And therefore, if there is no sexual dimorphism, there is nothing for sexual selection theory to explain. Voila! And this extraordinary position, in large part, seems to account for dynamic systems theory. Because if true, it would seem to dispose of that irritating dichotomy. Even though the evidence for sexual selection and dimorphism can only be described as overwhelming. But there is another, more subtle problem with this mode of feminist analysis, and this is apparent in her book, Sexing the Body, where she uses hermaphrodites, or in modern terms, intersex individuals, to support her contention that sex differences can be described as falling along a continuum. We can summarize her argument thus. Since intersexuals quite literally embody both sexes, this weakens the claim about sexual difference. The existence of intersex individuals implies that what we are really dealing with is a continuum. She then goes on to state that in the West we divide this continuum into two categories, male and female. But that division is a social decision and not one of biology. Therefore, she claims that the male-female dichotomy is a social construction. But there is more. Surgeons, she says, remove parts of intersex babies so as to force them into a male or female role. And this is an example of sex being surgically constructed. Hence, the male-female dichotomy is a social construction, and a false one at that. 
Well, there are several problems with this theory. The most obvious is she fails to provide any convincing evidence that other cultures divide this continuum into other categories, other than male and female. The other weakness is in its use of a continuum to define sex in the first place, because even if the substance of her argument is correct, we would still have male at one end of the continuum and female at the other. So her theory presupposes that which it seeks to deny. Both categories male and female sit at the extreme ends of her continuum. Even if we are extremely charitable in estimating the numbers of intersex individuals, which some sources claim to be as high as 1.7%, this would give us a modified bimodal distribution, not a continuum. 98% of the population would still be categorised as male or female, and sit at either end of her proposed continuum. Not a very convincing argument in my opinion. So the argument as proposed by feminists is already looking weak, and we've not even touched biology. We've only addressed the more obvious general problems, which in this case rests on deviation from two categories that sit at the extreme ends of a proposed continuum. Such views as expressed by Dr. Fausto Sterling have no explanatory utility that can be used for other species. Humans, she proposes, are quite unique in the animal kingdom when it comes to sexual dimorphism. Such theories are not clinically useful either, because when we look at the examples of intersex conditions cited in her work, they turn out not to be intersex at all, in the clinical sense. They are still either male or female biologically. There is a fixation on genitalia, but these obvious male and female parts do not define biological sex, and the surgical construction of genitals would not move any individual along any proposed continuum. We should also be mindful that biological sex is distinct from the concept of gender, and these terms are often conflated in a conversation, either through ignorance, but often deliberately so. We end our adventure at this point. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you would like to support my channel, I now have a Patreon page. If you're unable to support my work through Patreon, then you can share, like, or comment. It's all good. Thank you for